we have been engaged in this series. We have called it the Disciple Shift, where we have been talking about the eight habits of highly effective disciples. Um, you might not have been a part of this series. Uh, you might be curious about this. Um, so you can go back and watch all of this online. But we've been talking about eight things you can do eight habits you could practice that will not only draw you closer to Jesus, but would help you to be like Jesus so that you in turn can help others to be like Jesus too. And so at our church, we talked about making a shift and the power of shifts. And one of the first shifts we've asked you to make is to make the shift from being members to ministers. Amen? And there have been a lot of people who've stood up to take that challenge. And I've had people text me and say, Pastor, I want to make the shift. There are churches on the other side of Canada writing to us saying, we want to make the shift. And I saw the shift this week because we had Cassandra, a young adult, who stepped up and said, I'm going to be a minister, and she led VBS. Amen. And then she had 37 now, that may not seem like a large number to you, but we used to struggle to get 15 to 20 people helping us with VBS, and this week we had 38. People are making the shift, and we're getting engaged in ministries, and ministries are growing in our church. And I've been praising God that we've had people who've made that decision to make the shift from being members to ministers because you've embraced the disciple shift. And so we talked about habit number one, going from fans to followers, where we understand we're not just called to do morning devotionals, but we are called to be fully devoted to Jesus. And then we talked about prayer, and we were going to make the shift from talking to listening, because we understand that the purpose of prayer is not me getting what I want, but it is about me getting connected to Jesus because the power behind prayer is not the prayer, but the person to whom we pray. Amen? Amen. And then we talked about shifting from restlessness into relationship because God wants you to rest. And God has given you a day in which to rest, and in that resting, God wants you to shift into relationship with Jesus. And then we talked about shifting from me to us where I understand I am a part of something bigger than me, that I am called to be a part of the family of God whereby I become invested in you, you become invested in me, and together we grow in Christ, and then together we call the world into Christ. Amen? And then we talked about from knowing to sharing. Can I ask, do we as Seventh-day Adventists know some stuff? We know some stuff. We know that Jesus is coming, and we know that Jesus saves, and God has called you to share what you know with the world, and we call that witnessing. But we're also called, I'm sorry I skipped over one, from brokenness to wholeness. Because let's face it, all of us have got something we're dealing with. And what Jesus wants to do is to take all of the broken pieces of your life and put it all back together so that you can be whole and complete in Jesus. And we also talked about, well, shifting from hoarding to investing, whereby you become personally invested in the salvation and the relationship of other people with, and, and invest in their relationship with Jesus Christ, and we call that discipling or discipleship. And now, we're down to habit number eight, and that is you are called to be a blessing. You are called, literally by God, to bless, to benefit, and to add value to the lives of those around you. And so today we're going to be talking about what it means to be a blessing to those around you. So as you can see, this week was a special week here at the Nepean Seventh-day Adventist Church. We were hosting a vacation Bible school, and as you can see, our theme for this week is fiercely faithful. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to think about what comes to your mind when you hear that word fierce or fiercely. 
And so it got me thinking, and I decided I was going to ask the kids this week, well, how would you go about defining that word fierce? What does fierce mean to you? And I got five common answers, and this is what the kids shared with me. They said fierce is to be big, to be strong, powerful, proud, and dangerous. I had one young lady say, it's my mom. (laughs) So some of you had that mother too, right? (laughs) Yes, that was my mom. Uh, So apparently Dr. Zahiri is fierce. So uh, (laughs) I love that response. You gotta love kids. Now let me ask you, is God big? Did the kids get that right? Is God big? God says, I measure the span of the universe. The universe is 93 billion light years across, and God goes, I measure that with the span of my hand. In other words, our universe fits somewhere between God's thumb and his pinky finger. Is God big? Now let me ask you, is God strong and powerful? I want you to think about the last time you blew out a cake. You got, you got your wind up, and you went, and you might have blown out all the candles. God says, with a blast from my nose, I can part the Red Sea. This week you heard about the tornado. We've got to give a little testimony here and a little praise to God. You heard about the tornado that landed here in Ottawa. Well, it landed just over here in the field. And it began to snake in and through the neighborhood. And as it did, it made its way over to the school, and and we could see the debris moving, Um, road signs were being flattened, and and it was starting to come towards us. And and I began to piece together afterwards what happened by the path of the debris and the damage. Understand, the damage ends over there. It jumped over us here and landed in the neighborhood and continued on. Our God says, peace be still. And when it comes to the tornadoes, God can go, oh, no, you do not. Is God powerful? Our God, and we're giving him praise because while we were in the basement praying about this, that tornado is going over like a freight train. It sounded like a train was riding on our roof. And yet there was not a shingle out of place as the storm passed. And then we have some members who can tell you stories of their own. Is God powerful? Yes. And now let me ask you, is he proud? Yes. Yeah? Oh, I'm, loving, I'm glad you said that because there is a difference between a healthy pride and sinful pride. Do you know that there's a difference? You see, we all get the sinful pride because sinful pride is when I bring glory to me and I'm looking to benefit me and add value to me. That is self-centered love. Here is healthy pride. is a normal emotion that is derived from effort, persistence, and cultivation of behaviors that make you and the world around you a better place. Now, God's perfect. There's no improving on God. But let me ask you, is life better with Jesus in it? Do you understand that Jesus lives to add value to your life, and when God does something and it's good, God goes, and it is good. So, now I'm going to ask you, (laughs) is God dangerous? Is God dangerous? No, 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 listen to me carefully here. God is dangerous in the same way that light is dangerous to the darkness. God is dangerous in the same way that truth is dangerous to a lie. God is dangerous in the same way that a cure is dangerous to the disease. Do you follow me? God's goodness and righteousness is dangerous to anything that is sinful and evil and that which hurts his people. Is God dangerous? Now let me ask you. So, so far the kids, kids you got it right. Okay, my VBS kids, you got it right. And now let me ask you, is God fierce? And I asked him it like that, is God fierce? God is fierce? Now this one can get a little tough as well because when you go to the dictionary and you look up fierce in the dictionary, it has this word vicious. And I'm going, no, 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 no. That really doesn't describe my God, my Jesus. 
So I had to do a little digging deeper, and here's what I learned, is that God is fierce, meaning he is passionate and determined. Because you see, when God sets out to do something, his faithfulness is based on his determination to do it and get it done. And one of the things I've learned is that God is determined to bless his people. Do you know that God is determined to bless his people? Now understand, I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel here. Understand, I'm not going to give you a formula. I'm not going to give you a set of things you can do, like the prayer of Jabez or some favor formula where you can get God's favor into your life. It's not what I'm talking about. You don't have to convince God to bless you because God wants to bless you. If you are God's people, understand, God wants to bless you. The fact that you're alive today, God has blessed you. Are you saved? God has blessed you. Scripture tells us God causes the sunshine and the rain to both fall on the just and the unjust because God is into blessing people. And what we're going to discover here today is why it is that God wants to bless you. And in discovering why he wants, you to, wants to bless you, I'm hoping today that you will make the decision to make the shift from being blessed by God to be a blessing to others. Let me start out by sharing with you a story I heard. There was a man who owned a company, and he was one of those people with a spirit of generosity, and he heard that his local food bank was in trouble. And he decided he wanted to do something about it. He wanted to host a food drive that would be led in the community by his company. And he wanted 100% participation from every employee, from himself all the way down to the janitor. He was determined to have 100% participation. And so he sent out a memo. And the memo told all the employees, we're hosting a food drive, we're going into the community, and I expect 100% participation. Everybody's to be involved. Memo went out. But there was one employee who read the memo, walked up to his supervisor and said, "Um, no thanks, I'm I'm not going to be a part of it. And the supervisor said, you understand this is a directive from the boss. He's literally paying for your day for you to do this. And the guy said, you know what? I know I'm not interested. And the supervisor said, you know, I have to take it to the boss. And he did. He took it to the boss. And he said, listen, we've got a guy. He's not interested in being a part of this. Boss said, send him to me. Man walks into the boss's office. And the boss says, well, what seems to be the problem? And the man said, well, I'm really not interested in in, in helping the food bank. He said, don't get me wrong. Good people. They do a good work. They do an important work. I just don't want to participate. And the boss looked at him and said, I am determined. He said, I am determined that 100% of our company is going to be engaged this. I am determined we're going to have 100% participation. So he said, this is going to go one of two ways. He said, either you're going to get fully on board or I'm going to let you go. What's it going to be? And the man said, well, since you put it that way, uh, I'm all in. He goes back to his supervisor. The supervisor says, well, what happened? And the man says, I'm all in. Supervisor says, well, why did you change your mind? And the man said, well, nobody actually quite explained it to me the way the boss explained it to me. Here's why I'm sharing that story with you. Because how we hear something and how we understand something will affect how you behave. If I can change the way you understand something, we can help you change the way you behave. Let me say it again. How you hear it and how you understand it will change the way you behave. For example, her name was Mrs. Hunter. And Mrs. Hunter was called into court to serve in jury duty. And when the judge looked at her and said, well, is there a reason why you can't serve today? She said, sure. Uh, I don't believe in capital punishment. And the judge said, well, hang on, ma'am. The man didn't kill anybody. He's actually being sued by his wife. 
because he promised to take $12,000 and renovate her kitchen for her birthday, but instead, he went out and he gambled away all $12,000. Mrs. Hunter looked at the judge and she said, Your Honor, I think I need to change my mind about capital punishment. <laughs> how you hear something and how you understand it will change the way you behave. And so today I'm going to do the best I can by God's grace to help you understand why it is that God not only blesses you but calls you to be a blessing. And so basically there are two reasons I can think of why it is that God would want you to be blessed. Now let me ask you, can God bless you? Does God have the means and the ability to bless you? Yes. Right? Unlike Mr. Hunter. Oh, I couldn't believe this story when I read it. He was 67 years of age when he died. It was 1997. And when he died, he bequests, bequested, is that, am I pronouncing that right? He decided to give away. Okay, there we go. <laughs> he decided to give to the city of St. Louis one billion dollars. And then he decided to give away millions of more to youth in inner cities who needed help. And then at the end of it all, he decided he was going to bequeath, got it, he was going to bequeath a trillion dollars to the federal government to pay down the debt. And the problem is, when he died, he was flat broke. <laughs> he didn't have a penny to his name. He had good intentions but he couldn't deliver on his desires. Can God deliver on his determination to bless you? Right? Now, now here's the thing. We Christians, oh, we love that word blessed. How was your week? I was blessed. Right? Right? You leave the church, be blessed. God bless. My custom is at the end of my emails, and people can tell you this, is, is the word blessings. And I have that there because I want God to do something good in your life. Who doesn't want to be blessed? I mean, who doesn't want God to do something in your life because God is a good God, right? And, and the Bible writers understood how much you wanted to be and needed to be blessed by God. I love David when he wrote in Psalms 20 and 4, may he give you the desire of your heart. That's tall. That's huge. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all of your plans succeed. And David could say that because he knew God could deliver on it. Yeah. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 9 and 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. I love this one. Ephesians 3 and 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond, beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, can God deliver on his blessings, right? If God is determined to bless you, God can make that happen. So, I love this. Think about what Paul's saying. God's got blessings in store for his church and his people, and you can't even imagine it. I have an overly active imagination. I do. I dream big, I think big, and God goes, Bob, my ways are higher than yours. My thoughts are higher than yours. I got things planned, Pastor Bob, you can't even imagine. Because he's a good God. Now, maybe you're wondering why it is that God Almighty, God Omnipotent, God All-Powerful would want to bless you. Why would he want to do that? And today I want to share with you just two reasons. I believe there are more, but there are two reasons that God would want and does want to bless you, and the first is this, because he loves you. Now, I've been trying, I've been trying to teach you this definition of love because it's biblical love. When somebody asks you, what is love? I want you to be able to recite this. Love is you 
intentionally doing something to bless and benefit and add value to the life of another person expecting nothing in return. This is biblical agape love. Let me say it again. It's you intentionally. You have to choose it. You have to be determined to do it. This is your God. And what you're determined to do is to bless somebody, to benefit somebody, and to add value into their life. The divorce rate would plummet if husbands and wives practice that, where you make it your determination every day to wake up and figure out how somewhere in your day you're gonna bless your spouse, benefit your spouse, and add value to your spouse, expecting nothing in return. How do you do that for your boss? Some of you are like, Pastor Bob, you haven't met my boss. My boss works for the devil. What about your boss? When was the last time you added value to your boss's life, not his business? You get paid to do that. What about your enemy? How about your next door neighbor who doesn't like your lawn or your fence? Can you add value to his life? Oh, please don't tell me Christianity is a crutch. This requires God's grace and power. But you are called. Imagine what the condition of our world would be if everybody in the world just would look for somebody today to love. What is the definition of love? It is to intentionally, intentionally bless and benefit and add value to another person's life expecting nothing in return. We could convert the world with that kind of Christianity. And God does this because he loves you. Now, Here's the thing. You might be questioning my definition, and it's not mine. I I discovered this from people who are wiser than me. But somebody once asked children to define love. Like, like what would love look look like to you as a child? Watch what the kids said. They said, well, this is from Billy, age four. When someone loves you, the way they say your name, well, it's different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. Love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. Chrissy at age six. Look at this from Danny, age seven. Love is when mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure the taste is okay. Okay, some coffee lovers here. Okay, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you hate. (laughs) A little child shall lead them. Love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt, then he wears it every day. (laughs) That's Noel, age seven. And, And this from Claire, age six. My mommy loves me more than anybody. You don't see anyone else kissing me to sleep at night. And then we have this one from Elaine, age five. I love this one. Love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. (laughs) Jerk chicken, too. Okay. Do you understand? Kids understand what love looks like. It's you choosing to bless, to benefit, and to add value to the life of somebody else. Now, if kids know this, then how much more does your heavenly Father, who is love, know this? Look at this. It's Matthew 7, 11, Luke 11 and 13. If you being evil and know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more Would their Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? James 1, 17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Why does God bless you? Because he loves you. Now the question I need to ask you today, and this is going to get a little heavy. Brace yourselves. 
Do you trust the love? Do you trust the love? So do you trust the love when God says no? I'm happy to hear that. Okay, I hear some conviction in that. Some others? Maybe not. Here's where I'm going with this. There is a blessing in the no. When God says no, you need to understand that he's still trying to bless you. Do you hear me? Because when God says, please do something, hear me. When God asks you to do something, he's trying to bless you or protect you or somebody around you because there's a blessing in the ask. But there is also times when God will come up to you and say no, and there's a blessing in the no because he's still trying to bless you and protect you or somebody around you. Now, as parents, we understand how this works, right? Mommy, can I have another candy bar? No. Can I stay up late tonight? No. Can I play in traffic? Well, how are you behaving today? No. No, you say no. Because you understand there's protection and blessing in the no. So some of you, you might be praying right now for that boyfriend or girlfriend, and God is saying no, because they crazy. <laughs> oh, you really want to date the guy. I really want to date that girl. And God goes, no, you have no idea. This is like a bag of cats. You don't want to be a part of this. Or you might ask God and say, God, I want that job. I want to work for that company. And God goes, no, because that boss is crazy too. You hear me? You might be walking into a car parking lot and and you're looking at this car and you're praying, God, I claim this car in Jesus' name. And God goes, nope. Because that's a lemon. That thing's going to get you killed. Do you hear me? Do you trust the love? Because the Bible's got a few no's in it. And so when God says, Don't eat the rats, cats, and bats. He's trying to protect you. Along with, leave alone the pork chops. Leave alone the crab. The lobsters. The oysters. Because he's trying to protect your health. And when God says, I want you to go and bless other people, God is saying, because I want to bless and enrich and increase you. Now, how do I know this? Because it's reason number two. Now, understand, you might be wondering why God seems to bless some people more than he does others. Have you noticed the times that might happen? And the reason there are times when that happens is because God wants you to use your blessings to bless other people. And what you'll discover is that you can't outgive God, you can't outlove God, you can't outserve God, and all God wants to do is to increase you so that you can bless others and bring them into the kingdom. This was the principle behind the blessing that God gave to Abraham. Look at this. It's Genesis 12, 1 and 2. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Now look at this, jump down a couple of chapters. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Genesis 18, 17, 18. Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation. Stop right here. What did God said? Surely. Do you know why God could say surely? Because God was determined to make it happen. Could he make it happen? Yes. Absolutely. He will surely become a great and mighty nation and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I would love to hear God say, I'm going to bless Nepean so that all of Ottawa may be blessed. 
If we want to move into a greater blessing, understand God intends every blessing to be a tool in and through you whereby God can bless Ottawa. Now, here's what I've discovered in life. I've done a little construction. I've discovered that every tool has a purpose. And you will understand its purpose because of its name. Folks, what do we call this tool? It's a level. Now, I want you to imagine that you hire a carpenter to build you a house, and the carpenter refuses to use this one tool. And he says, I don't need the tool because I'm going to eyeball it and I'm just going to keep a level eye and and with my eye, I'm just going to make sure everything's level. Is there anything that could go wrong if a carpenter refuses to use the tool? Right? Your house can be crooked. Imagine if your floors were like this and the ceiling was like this. Is there anything that might go wrong with your home later on? If it doesn't drive you crazy first, right? You need to understand that every tool has a purpose and its purpose is in its name. You have a name. You have a name. Your name is Seventh Day Adventist Christian. And God calls you to be a tool in his hand whereby he wants to bless you so that you can become a blessing to others. And we're about to end this series the way we started it because God is calling you to make the shift from being a member to a minister who is a tool in God's almighty hand to shift and to change Ottawa because God is going to use the blessings he's poured into this church to pour it into this community to shift it for Jesus. Amen? Amen. And this is what God wants to do in our lives. The question is, Will you use the blessings? Will you make the shift from being blessed to being a blessing? A pastor once asked, he once asked his congregation the following question. Where would you be if you had all the money your heart desires? If you had the most fabulous home in the perfect neighborhood, if you had no worries, if you came home to the finest gourmet meal that was waiting for you, if your bath water had been prepared, uh, if you had perfect kids, if your spouse was waiting for you every day with open arms and kisses, so where would you be? To which one of the members of the congregation cried out, I'd be in the wrong house. Follow me. Pastor's intentional today. Follow me. Where would you be if everybody around you loved you? Where would you be if everybody around you was invested in your relationship with Jesus? If everybody around you believed in you, if everybody around you had your back, if everybody around you wanted to add value to your life, if everybody around you knew you weren't perfect, but they loved you anyway, where would you be? Nepean, amen. You should be in church because this is the church. It's a recipe for a healthy, growing church whereby we are so devoted to Jesus that we become invested in each other's relationship with Jesus so much so. I love you so much so. I don't care about your faults and your flaws. What I want to do is bless you and benefit you and add value to your life so that through my life, through the name of Seventh-day Adventist Christian, God can use that name to show the world what Jesus is like. And this is why, we're going to come down now. This is why God has called you to the Seventh-day Adventist Church 
and to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ so that in taking God's blessings and blessing others, people can go, wow, that's what Jesus is like? And then they too would be inspired to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Here's what John said. Jesus said this. John wrote it. Jesus said in John 13, 35, here's how everyone will know that you are my disciples. When you love, when you intentionally bless, benefit, and add value to the lives of everyone around you. Can you make the shift from being a member to a minister? Can you accept the call to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple who is one, who makes one, because you take your blessings and you add them to another person's life? Can you make the shift? Can we go from being blessed to blessing? And let's show Ottawa what Jesus is really like. Amen?